So I learned this song in Sunday school. And we're going to start a little bit with teaching. How many remember this song in Sunday school? Huh? And we would do this. We would do male first and then male. So we're going to do a little bit before we get started. The women say, this is the day. Come on. This is the day that the Lord has. Test, 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 hallelujah. There we go. Let's do that one more time. Let's just put our hands together and give the Lord a clap offering of praise. God is so, so good. Maybe seated. We're going to go right into our session. We want to give Dr. Michael Knight as much time as possible. So we'll extend this, the sessions today until 3 o'clock. I'm kidding. Um, thank you for being here this morning. Please welcome to this podium right here, Dr. Michael B. Knight as he comes, and we're just going to pray. In fact, let me make sure I do the right thing because I want to make sure I don't miss anything, but I think I've got it. So here we go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We ask you to anoint Dr. Knight this morning. We pray your blessings on his life, in his life, and through his life. God, I pray that you would impart to him all that you have prepared in him in this moment. We pray for his family, and God, we pray for the direction of this session today. Teach us, lead us, guide us, send us out. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, and uh, good to see each and every one of you. Uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, yes, uh, put this um, slide up a minute. Thank you for your prayers, and thank you for your kind comments last night. Last night, we began to talk about the problem. We're not wrestling against what we think we're wrestling against. We're not wrestling against cultural relevance. We're not wrestling against clever marketing. We are wrestling against philosophies. And the New Testament makes that perfectly clear. But we're living in a world where our young men and women in the church, we haven't even got to the uh, church, in the church are actually asking questions like, how do I know the Bible is true? Now, how many believe Jesus is coming back? That's actually a very precious statement to me this morning. How many of you realize that the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God? How many of you know He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you? Now, if I could prove to you that the Bible is historically true. And remember when I taught you last night that when you change your preaching and you stop preaching stories, and you start preaching historical facts, it changes the way a young generation hears you. So if I can prove that the Bible is true, and that German higher criticism specifically, which believes that Adam and Eve were metaphorical, and uh, they believe there was no Nebuchadnezzar, it's a spiritual message, and there was no Hittites, and there were no Belshazzars, and no... 
Gideon, uh, they actually just found Gideon's name uh, in ancient antiquity. Archaeologists did just in the last couple of months. If I could prove to you that the Bible could be trusted historically, then how much more would the spiritual message mean to you? That he's a good God. And if I could show you that the fears of Charles Darwin are worse today, and I used to be a theistic evolutionist, and my battle isn't against God using some forms of, of uh, mic or macro evolution, um, but my argument is that evolution is impossible mathematically and improbable without God. And I believe that the earth has to be younger than older, and I'm not going to be so brash to give a date, but the Bible says death entered into the world through sin. So when you look at a fossil record, you're looking at a record of death. So you have to be very careful here. I also know that the evolutionary tree has been proven to be a joke. I also know, and I'll talk about this at the very end, that Charles Darwin was the greatest racist of any philosophical person. That's a fact. He influenced Margaret Sanger, who was the president of Planned Parenthood. He is the origination of eugenics and the uh, pursuits of Adolf Hitler. He uh, destroyed aborigines because of his racist understandings. And we'll get to that. But if I could show you today how you could look at a generation and just simply ask some scientific questions about if you believe what Charles Darwin has preached his whole life, why are his six greatest fears worse today than they were in 1859? Not to mention he wrote Origins of the Species six times and changed it all six times. Not to mention that he looked at a cell and said it was nothing. It was like a piece of disposable matter. We now know that is anything but true. And I wish I could go into cosmology, I wish I could go into naturalism, I wish I could go into a lot of areas of apologetics, but if I just helped you today to do two things, prove the Bible as a historical fact, and number two, establish the fact that God created man as a unique creature. And you begin to put that in your preaching, do you know it'll change the way you're retaining a generation? So if you don't mind and you're ready, I know we're not in Oz anymore, but give the Lord a hand clap of praise. All right, next slide. The philosophies are the root to the deep struggle in this generation. Do you realize, next slide, the atheists among the U.S. population that in Generation Z, and I'm finishing a Ph.D. in that subject actually, the atheist population that this generation of Americans has the largest population of atheists out of any American cohort ever. There are more teenage atheists and agnostics in this generation than ever before. But our values, you have to understand that the values of our children are set by six. And the worldview is formed by 13. It is a myth to say that we are losing a generation in college. We're losing them in middle school. Now, here's the other thing you need to know, and I could talk for an hour about this, but I don't have the time today. Do you understand that when you send an evangelical to a place of higher education, specifically Pentecostal charismatic kids or any kind of passionate evangelical adolescents, that education increases faith, it doesn't reduce it? But if you were to send a Muslim or a Buddhist or any other kind of religious entity as an adolescent to higher education, it reduces the faith? Why are you shocked when God is a God of common sense and He's rational and the more educated you become, the more and all you really get of Him? The percentage of people with worldviews right now that are adolescents is about 7%. And what we know that non-Christian barriers to faith that they have told us through Barna and told us through Pew and told us through um, Gallup and a whole host of others, that our kids that are passionate evangelicals, that adolescents in America are actually struggling, number one, with evil and suffering. 
Now, you can go to neverbefore.tv and listen to my podcast about how you answer how does a good God allow evil and suffering. But we also know that science and the authority of Scripture are two of their big Achilles heel. The problem is it's acceptable for someone to be born one gender and feel like another according to engaged Christian adolescents. I'm talking about the kids in your church. 44% of them actually say that it's okay to be born one gender and feel another. When it comes to sexu- sexuality and gender, this is the first generation to find their identity and their sexuality, not in the fact they were created in the image of God. 7% uh, claim to be bisexual. One in eight of all 13 to 18-year-olds describe their sexuality as something other than that. And what's so interesting to me is that the identifiable characteristic of someone's worldview about sexuality, specifically finding their identity in sexuality, is directly related back to their religious upbringing and what they really believe. So we're back at worldviews. In other words, you raise your child to believe that there is a God, and they come to a place to where there isn't a God, And then it is their sexuality that influences the deconstruction of their faith. I had a lady walk up to me a couple weeks ago, Dr. Sean, in one of these things we've been doing. And she said, would you pray for me? And I said, of course I'll pray for you. She said, my daughter was raised in the church of God. And now she's a lesbian. And I've been praying for her and she became a lesbian. She moved from being a lesbian to a man and went through transgender reassignment surgery. She goes, I prayed for her, I loved her, and I I loved her and would continue to talk to her. Well, she started living a life as a man, and if that slide wasn't enough, she began from that point to become an atheist after having served God and been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The good news is, she said, now, in the last eight months, she's come back to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What do you do in Babylon at that point? What you realize is percentages of teens that have a worldview is very, very slim. I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, When you look at uh, Pentecostal Charismatic Adolescents, I just finished a national survey, ages 12 to 28 years of old, nine denominations and family movements in Pentecostal Charismatic circles, passionate evangelicals that believed in a spirit-filled gospel, And I surveyed 2,500 of them, and here's what I found. I found that most of them are struggling with, they're not struggling with whether the Bible can be trusted or not. In other words, what I'm trying to say very quickly is that when you raise a child and they have a religious experience with God, remember the five things I taught last night at the very beginning. When they have a religious experience with God and they have parents that love God, and they have other people around them that are modeling and and mentoring them, and they have a Bible study and a prayer life, and they have less doubts, and you are preaching apologetically to them, and then they have a religious experience with God, that what happens is that Pentecostal charismatic adolescents do better than conservative adolescents, and that when we do it right, we're doing it very well right now. Give God a hand clap of praise for that. Amen. I could go in and talk more about the Bible and how I believe that the Bible is historically accurate. And, but the problem is they're having trouble with evolutionary issues. I believe that God created this world by evolutionary processes alone. Next slide, son. Thank you, buddy. Uh, next slide. There we go. And what we found out is that a lot of them report, I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to respond that I'm not created in the image of an ape. I don't know how to respond to the fact that life had intermediate life forms. And so, go on down to the next one. It says, Satan has convinced this generation that the Bible is not true. The next slide. Satan has, there we go. There we go. Satan has convinced this generation that the Bible is not true. How many believe the Bible is true? Let me see your hands. Now, how are you going to prove that? How do you respond? How do you respond? Because after all, there's a place in the Bible where the king is 42 and another place in the Bible where he's 24 and it's the same king. Do you realize that the Bible has a historical record of investigation? That you're not the first one to ask these questions? 
that the Bible has a historical record of investigation that you're looking at the pool of Bethesda. Do you understand that in 116, uh, 160, Melito of Sardis actually went and said, these are nice stories, but show me where they happened. Let me go back in 160 A.D. and take me back to 33 A.D. and show me where these things happened. Do you understand that origin of Alexandria in 230 actually visited and learned in the footsteps of Jesus and the 12 apostles? Do you understand in 320 A.D., Alexander of Cappadocia, for the purpose of prayer and investigation, went to the places of the stories of the Bible. Now, i, I got to just show you this. How many of you love Planet of the Apes, the movie? I do too. This is where they got the set from, Cappadocia. It's in Turkey, actually, friend. Do you realize that Helena, who was the mother of the Roman emperor in Constantine, actually went and investigated where these things happened? Do you understand that the early church left us a model? Number one, they would take a church and they would put it on the ashes of a demonic or pagan temple. They would actually win so many people to Christ no one I, I no longer needed the temple of Isis or Diana and they would build a church on top of the ashes of Diana. That's a, a second century church right here. Do you understand that one of my best friends who has a Ph.D. from Cambridge is sitting right here, Ryan Jackson. You want to talk about, remind me to tell you that story one of these days, Dr. Walker. This young man is brilliant. And he is sitting, you have to, and you get, guys listen to me, I get excited when I get into this. Do you understand they built a church on purpose in a specific place? The early churches. So don't think you don't have a history, because you do. Ryan is sitting in the city of Heropolis, I've been there multiple times, and what happened there is this asp, which is what we would consider a stage, and then the church right here, the asp was always built in a holy moment place. And Philip, the disciple of Jesus, was crucified or martyred right there. He died right there. And so this is the church of Philip, and we just recently found it within the, when I first went there, they thought they had found something. When I went back a year later, they knew they had found the church of St. Philip, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, and they found a whole lot more. God, Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Now, I know this can be controversial, and I know a lot of it can be embellished, but there is truth to the fact that the early church collected relics and were very aware of history. But do you know there's 25,000 sites in the Scriptures that have been confirmed by archaeologists? There's over 100,000 artifacts found by archaeologists just in the city of Jerusalem or Palestine. Do you understand that this slab is where they laid one of the 12 disciples, the disciples of Philip, even the Muslims know it's true now and will agree with you, that this was the tomb of St. Philip. Now if I could show you the tomb of St. Philip, how much more powerful are the words of St. Philip? Do you understand that the science of archaeology will say to you, many of them are agnostic or atheists, and they'll say to you, that an archaeological find has never controverted the biblical, biblical passage. Ever. Ever. So don't you dare let anyone tell you that the Bible has been proven wrong by archaeologists because the archaeologists will say themselves that the Bible has never been proven wrong by an archaeological dig. As a matter of fact, Dr. Dr. Nelson Gluck, one of the most famous archaeologists in the world and a Jewish man, actually said, I can attest that the Bible is the greatest record of history that we have about antiquity. Give God a hand clap of praise in this place. So I want to encourage you to begin to get into the lives of your young men and women and have intentional, with your children too, intentional conversations about reestablishing biblical authority. As a matter of fact, you're, you mean to say with somebody with your education you actually believe those Bible stories? Are you crazy? I know you Pentecostals go by your emotion and you'd rather work with your limbic system than your amygdala, but are you serious? 
I, I, let me answer that in, in the Greek. No. Let me answer it in Hebrew. No. Let me answer it in English. No. No, 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 no. What you're looking at is they used to make fun of us and our forefathers because they said that the Bible in the, in the Pentateuch could not have been written by Moshe. That it was impossible for him to write the Bible because there was no language during the time of Moshe, Moses, Moshe. And so what happened is that they haven't just found one language now. They have found 50 languages preceding Moses in which he could have used to write the scriptures. And just two years ago, they found that rock, which is the oldest ABCs in the world. Let God be true and every man be a liar. What I need you to understand is that you're looking at this little rock. And uh, I went to the Penn Museum a couple of weeks ago researching this. Uh, this is uh, the Spicer Stone. It is about that big, maybe a little smaller. There is a naked man, a naked woman, a tree, a piece of fruit, and a snake on the rock. Now, I'm not saying that's Adam and Eve, but I am telling you someone in 3,250 B.C. actually believed that a man was naked, a woman was naked, they ate a piece of fruit, the tree from a tree, and a snake showed up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, take a good look at this one. Genesis 3 and 13 says that the snake crawled on two legs. Now, if I can prove the Bible to be historically true, how much more is it true that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then those of us who remain shall be caught up, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If I can prove that Genesis 3.13 is true, how much more is it true that he will never leave me, never forsake me, and he'll be with me like a friend that sick is closer than a brother? You're looking at the oldest according to paleontologists, fossils in the world of a snake. The problem is with this piece of antiquity that paleontologists will swear all the day long is a snake, and we know it's a snake because of its vertebrae, because of its structure. But do you realize there's something attached to this? There are two legs attached to the oldest snake fossil in the world. And we know it's a snake. Do you understand that Job said the Leviathan came about and moved his tail and crushed a cedar tree? Do you understand that you're looking at the skin of a T-Rex? And there's something really wrong here because it's got blood in it? How can blood last hundreds of millions of years? Do you understand that we're finding dinosaur footprints on the same rock stratification as humans? And I, I really push back on this one, but it's absolutely, definitively true. That we're not just finding, see, in evolutionary theory, in evolutionary trees, birds cannot be where dinosaurs are, and even though Land of the Lost was a cool cartoon in the 70s, it's not true. Dinosaurs, humans, and birds cannot be on the same rock stratification underneath the earth. It, they can't be. But now we're finding human footprints, and I'll get into this at the end, along with dinosaur footprints. As a matter of fact, we're finding hammers that humans used on the same rock stratification. We are actually finding Permian stratification with dinosaurs and birds where a human footprint, and I'll teach you about this real quick in the end, that a human footprint is being found right next to a bird and right next to a dinosaur. Do you understand that human footprints and dinosaur footprints are being found by the thousands in different places, Turkey, Russia, Colorado, New Mexico, on the same rock stratification? We're finding them in Russia. You'll go to the next one, son. Thank you. We're finding them actually in the British Museum. Go to the next one, son. Thank you. In the British Museum. And let me tell you where this came from. This is a dinosaur. This is clearly a homo sapien, a, a human footprint. This was in the British Museum at the turn of the century when their first exhibit in the British Museum was about the Garden of Eden. 
They actually have a woman named Guadalupe. And I don't believe in conspiracy theories except Jesse James, and I ain't got time to explain that. He was in my family, but I don't put it on resumes. <laughs> it's hidden in the British Museum along with the Guadalupe woman because she didn't fit the tree. I should say the chaos now. Everybody take a good look at the walls of Angkor Wat, this next picture. Because how did somebody in 900 A.D. in, in, uh, in Angkor Wat in Cambodia know what a dinosaur looked like? I'm just asking questions. You don't mean to tell me you believe about Noah's Ark, do you? Oh, you've been drinking the Kool-Aid, haven't you? I'm glad you brought that up. Look at the Ark tablets. Every major civilization in the history of humanity has believed the earth was flooded. The Greeks believed it. The Romans believed it. Uh, the Persians believed it. Sumer believed it. Acadia believed it. The writings of Gilgamesh talk about it being uh, a world that was flooded. We have multiple cultures. Matter of fact, not some. All cultures have a flood story. And they're called the Ark Tablet. Now, young man, we're going to get to a video, and I hope you'll be able to play that. Everybody take a good look at this guy. How many of you seen the movie Titanic? All right? This is the man that found the Titanic. His name is Robert Ballard. And Robert Ballard said, I'm going to go look for Noah's Ark. And if this video doesn't play in just a moment, go to YouTube, punch in ABC, Good Morning America, Robert Ballard, and Noah's Ark and watch the video. Or you can even go to neverbefore.tv and watch the video. But he said, you know what? I'm going to go look for Noah's Ark, but I'm not going to find a boat. I'm not going to find wood. What I'm going to find is a civilization flooded around 5000 B.C. See if the video will play, guys. Next video. Tonight on ABC, Christian goes back to the Holy Land to take us inside the history and mysteries of the Bible. And Christian, you met with one scientist who says there's actually proof that the great flood that took away Noah's Ark existed? Well, as you can imagine, historians, archaeologists, uh, discoverers are always trying to figure out were these stories true, what aspects of them were. Now, nobody really believes they'll ever find an ark. I mean, for obvious reasons, wood, decay, etc. But Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic shipwreck in 1985, believes that there is evidence of a massive flood about 7,000 years ago, which is when the Bible situates Noah's story, and he thinks it's in the Black Sea region of, the, uh, of Turkey. Let's take a listen. Our journey to investigate the story of Noah and his ark led us to the banks of the Black Sea in Turkey, where we heard that tantalizing clues were being uncovered by Dr. Robert Ballard, one of the world's leading underwater archaeologists. All right, let's get closer down. We were astonished to learn that he believes the biblical flood could have actually happened. And he says he can find proof. Oh, Something here. What's this? What's this? If you were to discover definitively something that could pin science on the Noah story, how fantastic would that be? Well, it would be pretty cool. And I'm confident we can. We just have to look. Now, using advanced robotic technology, he's traveling even further back in time. I'm putting a lot of money in the water, and obviously can't wait to see what it's going to see. We talk about the floods of art and living history. Boy, they don't compare at all to the floods of ancient time. The question is, was there a mother of all floods? Ballard thinks there was, and he's testing a controversial theory that the biblical flood happened here. Why the Black Sea? Well, because the Black Sea appears to have had a giant flood. Not just a slow-moving, advancing rise of sea level, but a really big flood, and people were living there. The theory goes this was once an isolated freshwater lake, but then, when the Mediterranean swelled... At some magic moment, it broke through and flooded this place violently. What did Noah, or the people who lived there during what you believe to be this huge flood, what did they see? It probably was a bad day, and a lot of real estate, 150,000 square kilometers of land, went under. And 400 feet below the surface, Ballard believes he's found proof of that catastrophic event. I love it. I love it. I love it. They unearthed an ancient shoreline. Well, we actually dated it, about 5,000 B.C. 
And that is about the time that the Bible says exactly. Noah and the great flood happened. I mean, wow. Wow. So it nailed it. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in here for the accuracy of the Word of God. Do you know that when you do your DNA and you go to Genesis chapter 10 and you look at the ethnicities and the dispersion of ethnicities, that your DNA today can actually tell you whether Genesis 10 is true or not. And that Genesis 10 has never been controverted by an ethnicitist. Ever. The Bible is so accurate that when it mentions the Tower of Babel, we've now found what's called ziggurats. We found over 30 of them in the Mesopotamian, which were nothing but towers up to the gods. Do you understand that we, and this is going to be, listen, I got this is difficult because you've been drinking the Kool-Aid through the culture. Understand? But you need to understand that if there is a God, and Jesus is God, and the Bible is the Word of God, then the stories can be proven true in many places, including the Tower of Babel in Iraq because we have found the actual blueprint of Nebuchadnezzar building the Tower of Babel. Somebody give God's Word a hand clap of praise in this place. Do you understand that we can go to Ur, and we can go to Shinar, and we can go to Sumer, and we can go to... All of the ancient places that, mentioned, uh, that are mentioned in the Bible and prove them to be real. But what if I told you that I could take 53 people in the Old Testament and pray, and I do that in lethal faith, 53 people in the Old Testament and prove that they were actual historical human beings. What if I showed you Pharaoh's sheet shack in 1 Kings 11 and 40? What if I could show you that on this rock it says Pharaoh's sheet shack? What if I took you to Pharaoh Necho in 2 Chronicles 35 and 20 and showed you his name etched in history? What if I wanted to show you Pharaoh Hopra in Jeremiah 44 and 30 and show you what he looked like? What if I took you to Nebuchadnezzar in 2 Kings 24 and 1 and showed you his word and his name etched in ancient antiquity? What if I showed you the name of Belshazzar in a Q&A form about that size? What would you say that if I turned around, um, excuse me, I went backwards. What if I told you that I would show you a Pharaoh Shishak and I would show you uh, the Achilles heel of the Old Testament? Young man, go there. Do you realize that the greatest problem we have in Scripture and in theology is believing the story of the Exodus? And the reason we have trouble believing the story of the Exodus as far as an academic literature is concerned is because the man who wrote the history of Egyptology wrote it a thousand years later after these events happened. I just finished a course with one of the leading Egyptologists in the world, and let me show you what we're finding right now. Do you understand that this dead man you're looking at can increase your prayer life? Because you're looking at the dead body of Ramsey the Great. Only human being in the Bible that the Bible mentions that I can show you a picture of. And what's amazing is Dr. Shawnee had red hair. It's interesting. Because the Bible mentions Ramsey the Great, but that's been the problem. Let's talk about Avarice. Do you realize that they say that the Bible is wrong because Moshe says that in the land of Ramses, the problem is Ramsey was the greatest Pharaoh out of Egyptology. And so if Ramsey was the greatest Pharaoh, archaeological artifacts should show prosperity. But Moses says in the land of Ramses, the children of Israel exited. And we all know what the story of the Exodus brings. It brings lice and destruction and children dying and graves and, and all kinds of stuff. But do you understand that an archaeologist about six years ago began to dig underneath the land of Ramsey and found the land of Avrius? You may know it, Pastor, as the land of Goshen. And what they found was twenty to 30,000 Semitic graves, which means they were Jewish in origin. They went on and they began to find a very, very prosperous old palace of great wealth amongst the Semitic Jewish human being. His home had 12 columns in it. And in his home in the backyard, there were 12 graves, one of which was an Egyptian pyramid. Let me assure you of something very clearly. There is never, ever, ever, ever anyone in Egypt buried in a pyramid that did not have the power or the favor of Pharaoh. 
So they found 11 graves, and the 12th one was in the form of a pyramid. When they started looking in the pyramid, they found, and this is the actual artifact, they found this statue. That statue, when you see a bow haircut, when you, view, when you visit the museum, always is an indication that it's a Jewish or Semitic human being. Look on the, the tombs of the Lamb of Ramses. And when you see a bow black haircut, it's Semitic. It's a slave. The strap on the shoulder is the signi- the, uh, the, the, uh, it, it signifies the power of Pharaoh. So whoever this was was Semitic, and whoever this was had the power and the authority of Pharaoh in a Semitic Jewish city named Avris. You may know it as the land of Goshen. Let me show you what was on his shoulders, a coat of many colors. Let me show you what the statue looked like according to an atheist archaeologist. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that I can take 84 cities in the Old Testament and prove the fact that 70 of them were real? Go to the next one, young man. Okay, next one where it's got, there we go, 84, go to the next one, 70. Now go to the next one. Do you realize that I can take 72 New Testament cities and prove the existence of 72 of them? Help me get some time. Go to the next one. Thank you, buddy. Now, I want to tell you, I am very grace-oriented, and I don't apologize for it because God's given me a lot of it. Somebody say amen. And when I wrote, next one, young man, when I wrote this next part in the book, I repented all the way home. They have now definitively found Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was thought to have been on the five plains on top of a volcano with an oil well underneath of it. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I highly suggest you don't kick off God when you are underneath an oil well sitting on top of a volcano. What we now know is that they found 20 inches of ash over human femurs. What we now know is that bodies were blown apart instantly by such force unknown to the Milky Way in Earth itself. And what we found was something called tranitite. The only place you can find tranitite is after a nuclear bomb goes off in the Earth's atmosphere or in the galaxies because Earth is not hot enough to form tranitite. And so the archaeologists took this to the geologists uh, in uh, New Mexico, the Ge- uh, Geological Center for the United States, and said, tell me what this is. And she looked at the archaeologists and said, where did you get tranitite? He said, you won't believe me, just tell me what it is. She came back and said, this is definitely tranitite. So what we now know definitively by science is that a meteor came out of the galaxies and landed on Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the only logical scientific explanation for the presence of uh, Tranatite at Sodom and Gomorrah. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise, if you don't mind. I could, go ahead, young man, help me, buddy. You're doing a great job. I could talk about Sir William Ramsey's for the rest of my life. He was an atheist, and there's uh, lots of folklore that he became a Christian at the end of his life, but he didn't that I know of. However... They used to make fun and said the Hittites didn't sign a treaty with the Egypts any more than the Indians signed a treaty with New York and the Choctaws. And do you know that he began to take the Bible and he studied Hittite civilizations. He went where the Bible said Hittite people lived and he didn't find one Hittite civilization. And the Bible at that time was the only book in the world ever to mention Hittite civilization. He found 11 of them. And this is the treaty that our forefathers at New York Times made fun of our Christian forefathers. Be careful about laughing in the rain. You can go to the Valley of Elah and the Bible is so accurate that it gets geography right. You can go to the city of Gath and they have found the city of Gath and they've actually found a piece of pottery and on the piece of pottery... It says, go ahead, you guys, keep going, young man. Help me stay, there we go. 
Do you know what was on the piece of pottery found in the city of Gath? And this doesn't mean he drank out of this picture, but it does mean he was a famous man in the city of Gath where the Philistines lived. Goliath. Do you understand we found the walls of Jericho, and, they, and I've been here twice, and it fell exactly the way the Bible said. They used to make fun of us because of this. And then they found out how they made the walls. And it makes perfect sense. And the Bible is so accurate, young lady, that it gets the falling of a wall geometrically correct. Do you understand that the Queen of Sheba was said to be a very wealthy lady? And this woman is not the Queen of Sheba. She's an archaeologist. But she is standing behind the gold mine of the Queen of Sheba. And that is the palace to the Queen of Sheba. Do you understand we have a handwritten letter from Sanballat who made Nehemiah's life a living hell? Do you understand Nebo Sarsikam, which is Nebuchadnezzar's chief official, that we have his name in antiquity? Do you understand we can prove the king of Cyrus? Do you understand that King Uzziah, in the year that the Lord was high and lifted up, has now been proven in antiquity to be a real person? Do you understand that the house of David, and I could talk for an hour on this because they used to say we embellished the story of the Davidic kingdom because we wanted to intimidate, Israel wanted to intimidate their enemies. That it was not vast and it was not powerful. We now know that is not true. Do you understand there's 34 gods mentioned in the Old Testament and we can prove that 34 of them really existed? Do you realize that in Ephesus, and the Bible says that Paul stood before the Bema seat, that we actually have found the Bema seat in the city of Corinth, and that we've also found the arena in Ephesus where he uh, confronted the silversmith, that they used to take Christian's kids, listen to this, strip them naked here, and they would take a hot chair, put it in fire until the, until the iron chair turned red, put a naked Christian on the chair, strap them to the chair, bring them out in front of 25,000 people in the city of Ephesus, wait for the chair to cool, and then pull the body parts off, and the crowd went wild. Don't tell me persecution amongst Christians is a myth. Do you realize we know where Mars Hill was at? We found names like Er Erastus and Pontius Pilate, and that's a big one. They used to make fun of us all the time, and now we're finding things with Pontius Pilate's name. We found his road eight months ago. Do you understand we have found the grave of St. Philip? Do you understand that we have recently found, next one, young man, you're doing a great job, buddy. This rocked the world. And you remember, and i got to close quickly because i got to get to the evolution part, but you remember me telling you they built churches in holy places over holy sites for a reason. They found this home, and they knew it was a first century. Uh, they knew it was a first century Jewish home in Nazareth. When they began to dig on top of it, they found a church on top of it. And when they found the name of the church, the name of the church was the Church of the Nutrition, and we have found the boyhood home of Jesus Christ. Sensational if he's not real. Sensational if the Bible cannot be trusted. But how many of you know it can be trusted in Jesus is the Son of God? Give God a hand clap of praise if you don't mind. Young man, I need you to fly with me big time. We know about Mary Magdalene. Flavius Josephus records the, the, uh, the, the um, Jesus and his disciples. You've got to realize nobody gave any care when Jesus was walking around Galilee with 11 dudes and a bunch of women. It was only after he claimed to be resurrected that historians started taking note. The Babylonian Talmud talks about it. Gaius Suetonius Tranquilius, a Greek historian, talks about Jesus Christ in the first century. You understand Pliny the Younger, I could go on and on, and Claudius the 25, just help me fly, young man. Yeah, you're doing a great job. And that the Quinarius census, Christmas is coming up. They said I was eating um, dinner in Berlin with a lawyer friend of mine who's an atheist. And he looked at me and he thought he had me. He said, I can't believe you believe the Bible is true. I said, really, Randy? He said, yeah. He said, what about Quinarius' census? And I looked at Randy and I said, Randy, I love you. I said, but you need to get caught up on your archaeologist. They found that thing 30 years ago. The tomb of Jesus, I could talk for hours about it, but I don't have time. We found it. But do you realize they've left a map called the Madabo map? That we actually have a map that the early church left us that was found when they were building a new room on a prison in Jerusalem? Do you understand we know where the church of Laodicea is, young lady? Where Jesus said, don't be hot and don't be, or don't be lukewarm. I'd rather be hot or cold. Do you understand that we had 12 men to die for what they knew was a lie? 
or they died for what they knew was true. I understand someone in the Vietnam War standing in front of a tank, dying for something they believed in, but you're trying to con convince me that 11 men died for something they knew was a farce? I don't think so. You realize we've just found an 18-year-old boy in Jerusalem, crucified in Jerusalem, and we can't get the nail out of his foot today? But when I talk about what's new, we found the bulla of Jeroboam. We have found the name of Gideon. Go fast, young man. We have found uh, temple weights for the first temple in Jerusalem. We have found the dance floor where the uh, stepdaughter of Herod Antipas asked for the head of John the Baptist. We have found archaeological artifacts from the time of Nehemiah, and he actually found his walls. We found Nathan Melach's seal, which is a man mentioned by Josiah. We found the royal city of Anahopate, uh the third in Egypt. We found the church of Philip, Andrew, and Peter in what is now definitively uh, Bethesda. We have found proof of domestic camels when people made fun of us because the Bible says Abraham had camels. They said camels did not migrate in that period of biblical history, and we now know that was a lie. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. We have found local churches in Laodicea where John the Revelator said they were at. We have found the, the uh, archaeological evidence that proves the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount stood exactly where we said it stood. We have found new homes in Nazareth. We have actually found proof that the Bible is the Word of God. Somebody say amen. Now, quickly, young man, science is a friend of God. And Adam and Eve did exist, and scientists have found now definitively that all of life came from one couple. And interestingly, they named them Adam and Eve. Do you know that Stephen Hawkins, before he died, said, I found out something, who was an atheist, he's an atheist. He said, I found out something about the earth. He said, the earth did have a beginning. Do you understand that he said the earth has a beginning through the second law of thermodynamics, but we've also found our ancestor, Homo erectus, is a lot older than what the evolutionary tree said it was. So evolution has disproven the Bible, has fake, has it? Don't. Go too quickly. We have prehistoric snakes. I'll show you the new ones. But what is man that God is mindful of him? Go quickly, young man. I've got, to, I've got to fly. What is man that God is mindful of him? Take a look at this primate and look at it very carefully as I close. This is Lucy. And Dr. Walker, Dr. O'Neill, Miss Walker, you go to the museum in New York, you will find Lucy. But what you will not find, but you'll find it, Lauren, honey, on YouTube, where the BBC admitted that the archaeologist shaved her femur down so she would walk on two legs and not four. Take a good look at her skeletal structure and show me where feet are located. There aren't any. Hold that thought. Do you understand that if you were to look at the world stratification of the rocks, that Charles Darwin said, in the 1800s, that when we get to the Cambrian fossil stratification, one of the lowest levels of the Earth's atmosphere in the rocks and in, in beneath the Earth, that we must find intermediate life forms, a duck with one wing, uh, a trilobite with no anus, no eyes, one eye, a half of a vertebrae. And do you know what we're finding now at the pre-Cambrian fossil stratification? Life form completely appearing instantly. Now, unless you need a little bit more evidence, I know random mutations are what you think the Ninja Turtles are. But let me show you the sheep and give you a good understanding of what a mutation really is. Mutations, and I, I did a video, for those of you who are interested, for Perry Stone in front of 2,000 people. Uh, oh, it's on YouTube, Perry Stone's channel on evolution for an hour and 45 minutes. And I go deep into this. I don't have time to go deep into it, but mutations produce sterile offsprings most likely. So you're getting into mathematical odds. As a matter of fact, when you go to a museum, it always bothered me because they said that humans, homo sapiens, had skulls different than the apes, and I've been to the Cradle of Mankind in Africa, I've been to the New York Museum, I've been to the museums all over this world, you name it, I've been to those museums, uh, museum in London, 
uh, 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 Washington, D.C., you name it. And it always bothered me. And what changed me from being a theistic evolutionist to believing that God created the heavens and the earth and that man was created uniquely, and are there mutations of evolution that causes a white, a brown bunny to become white when it migrates to the Antarctic? Yes, there is. But we know that DNA does not change and cannot swap from a primate to a human being, too. And the next time you're in a museum and they show you the skull, Lauren, honey, of a prehistoric man, they claim, and they show you a homo erectus, all you have to do, young man, is turn the skull upside down or look underneath the display, and if the hole is in the middle, the creature must walk on two legs. The foreman controls the legs of whether you walk with two legs or four legs. If the hole is in the back, then you can swing from trees and you have the muscles that you need to do to walk on four legs. Now, the flat verses, monkeys cannot wear sunglasses because they don't have a nasal bone. You know a skeleton, whether it's human or ape-like, because of nasal cavities. Very simple. Do you understand that the pelvis, great job, young man, of a human is meant to walk on two, but the pelvis, pelvis of a primate is meant to swing from trees and carry its weight by its arms. That it actually has, like Lucy, a different pelvis than a human being. And we've never found any intermediate proof of life forms. Never. Do you understand that the foot you have right now is called pedalatal? And that you have to have a specific foot to... Um, a specific foot to be a human. Now, take a look at my buddy, uh, monkey. All right? Can a monkey walk on two legs? Now, I know I don't, I don't want to get this on camera, but I'm going to have to to prove a point. When you're a monkey, you can walk on two legs, but you walk like this because your, femurs, your femur and your bones are constructed to walk on two legs. You cannot walk with the stride of a human being with pedalal promotions. It's impossible. So, with that being said, everybody put your hand up in the air. Do this with me. One, two, three, four. Do it again. One, two, three, four. You just proved you're not a monkey. Humans' hands are meant to handle hammers and tools. A monkey's thumb in its skeletal system is so far back, it gives it the ability to swing from a tree. Human, primate, very simple. Do you understand I love Planet of the Apes, but take a good look at this. This is Caesar. This is the museum in New York, I believe. And this is Caesar from the Planet of the Apes. Show me what's wrong and different between two primates and what people put in a museum and what Hollywood has done. There's white scalia in the eyes. Primates cannot have brown scalia, nor would it last a hundred million years. It must be artistic license in the museum. And when you ask the artist, and you have to realize it takes 15 years to change an exhibit in a museum to catch up with modern science, that they put white scalia in this creature's uh, body to make it more human-like. Is it possible that intellectual people can be lied to? Now take a good look at Lucy, and I'm closing. This is what you find, Dr. Walker, Miss Walker, at the museum in New York. They never found her feet. But can I tell you something else? And check everything out I'm telling you. Scrutinize it to the nth degree. I hope you do. They now know she was a monkey. Go Google it. So Adam and Eve did exist, but then you've got people who 
where Margaret Sanger, go to the next one, young man. And all my African-American friends, listen to my heart. I'm from a family of abolitionists. I never understood why racism makes me so angry and until I began to study my genealogy and I understand it. But I hate the fact that you and your children are being lied to in the public school systems because Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood, said, and I quote, I did it to take colored people who are like human weeds and exterminate them in poor civilizations. You'll never hear that on CNN. If that's not bad enough, I'm not brave enough to tell Jenny Knight this. She's smarter than I am. Charles Darwin said that a woman is not as smart as a man because of evolution. And they call you the misogynist? The Bible is historically true. There are answers for your faith. Next one. And don't ever forget, you've got the only God that suffered with its people. God bless you. Have a good day. Wow. 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 Let's all stand for a moment. I want to ask Dr. Knight to come back over here for just a moment. And um, and I want to ask you to stretch your hand this direction. We're going to pray for Dr. Knight. Um, he received very tragic news last evening. His mother passed away last night after the service. And he was committed so much to be here today to do this that he didn't alter his plans today. But I want to ask you to pray for his mom, Wanda, has gone to heaven. Pray for his dad, Levi. Pray for Michael. Pray for his children, his brother, his family, his wife. Father, we thank you today for your grace. Father, I pray for this man, my friend and my brother, who's walking a legacy and his mother and father poured into him, have given and given and given and sowed and sowed and sowed and he's reaping a harvest around the world. We pray, God, that you give him strength and stamina and healing and comfort today. As he grieves and mourns the loss of his mother, celebrate this, that she's in heaven. But God, as he walks this journey over these next few days and weeks and months, we thank you for him sowing into us, pouring out the deep level of research, of understanding. For 30 years that you poured into his life so that he can point people to you, O oh Lord. Your son, Jesus Christ, and God, get them off a highway to hell onto a pathway of heaven. And God, we pray that his future days will be greater than his former. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray, God, that you bless his children, Lily and Ella and Aiden, and God, his family today. We pray for Levi, his dad. Strengthen him, comfort him, guide him. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's take a quick five-minute break, just stretch break. If you need to use the restroom, uh, we're going to come right back really fast. I'm going to ask a couple people to come up here, make your way up here. Um, Pastor Don Flowers and Pastor Glenn Sellis, if you guys just hang out up here in just a moment. God bless you.